All right. Hi, uh, all. My name is Andy Palmer. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Tamer, and serving as the track co-producer alongside JP Chavez for Virtual Track Six and the uh, CDO IQ Toolkit. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next session. Data mastering is the key component of data mesh. Uh, on the heels of our last session, uh, where we heard a lot about uh, data mesh uh, and data fabric. We are, uh, Mark Claire and I, my good friend Mark, and I are going to uh, dive into all the components of a successful data mesh st strategy that we believe really starts with data mastering. Uh, traditional data management has mostly failed or flatlined, but the convergence of modern intelligent data mastering and data mesh creates the opportunity to deliver tremendous business value really, really quickly. Um, and both Mark and I have had lots of experience doing this over the years. But uh, before I you know, move over into the discussion, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, the session's being recorded uh, and uh, any presentations will be included in the symposium proceedings. Uh, video recordings will be uploaded to the CDO IQ YouTube channel three months after the symposium. And uh, we'll have a Q&A uh, at the end. We've gotten some great questions already. And uh, uh, so, Mark, uh, without further ado, let's get let's dive in. I'm going to give my little spiel sure. about data mesh, and then you can like correct me and tell me because I know you've been doing data mesh and data fabric for uh, for many decades. So, well, it's it's not really a correction. Um, I mean, you and I know each other well enough. It's more how you apply it, and every company is a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the approach you would take, and you know, I've worked in several of the large banks around the world as yeah. well as in healthcare. And every organization is a little bit different. That's great. Well, um, let me let me. I'll take uh, go through a few things, and then I'd love to get your 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 history too. And I think a lot of people should know that many of the things that we're trying to do in the modern data enterprise uh, are are not necessarily really new to some of us. Um, but uh, let me let me just take a few minutes and talk about um, data mesh. So uh, if we um, go to the next uh, chart real quick here. So you know there are these aspirational principles of data mesh that that collectively we in the enterprise are all starting to get our heads around. And as I said before, like Mark and I have been working on a lot of these things for a really long time. And this is to us like motherhood and apple pie. Um, and uh, so we're, we're really, you know, like at some level, um, there, there are these primary approaches to managing data variety and data silos in the enterprise, uh, aggregation, standardization, uh, federation or or rationalization. Um, you know, it, it, the message for, from from us here is that all of these things are necessary, but none alone is sufficient. Sometimes when people talk about data mesh, they talk about well, it's either everything's decentralized or it's all centralized. And we're here to tell you, like the answer is yes. Like you have to do all of it, right? It's not as simple as one or the other. And you know, this idea of data as a product is familiar to us. Like Mark and I both have been working hard inside of enterprises to create value by delivering data as a product for, for decades. And so it really is sort of a core uh, principle now that is, is being widely adopted. And we're really excited about how uh, everybody has internalized this. Yeah, next. So, um, you know, as, you know, data is flowing from all the different sources of data throughout to all the different consumption endpoints, it's really key to think about your data products in context of these key, we like to call them logical entities, uh, customer suppliers, simple logical entities that serve as a framework for delivering, delivering your data as a product. Um, and at Tamer, we spend a lot of our time helping people organize their data around these kind of key logical entities. Uh, one of our great customers, Maersk, has about 140 of these key enter, uh, entities across their enterprise. And um, so this is a good core principle that now is being broadly adopted. So um, there's lots of different ways to organize around these different uh, uh, you know, principles for data mesh. And, you know, it's key, like we really believe that if you don't have key indexes for your uh, your data, it's going to be really difficult, if not impossible, to, to, to do a data mesh. And again, we'll, we'll talk about this in a second. Um, next. 
And so, you know, uh, you know, and we at Tamer, we spend a lot of time helping people clean up their data. And we really do view this as a bi-directional cycle. It's really essential um, to think of the process of cleaning and curating data uh, as not just a unidirectional thing from source down through to uh, consumption, but rather feedback from, from consumption feeding back into how you prepare the data and even the source data. All right, so uh, we're here to sort of tell you that, you know, uh, we think data mastering and data mesh is like chocolate and peanut butter. Um, and the reason we, we, we say that is probably because we've eaten a lot of Reese's peanut butter cups over the years. So, but Mark, like, could you just, you know, take a few minutes and tell us, tell everybody about your background and the experience that you've had doing, you know, enterprise data at scale uh, during the course of your career. Well, without aging myself too much, I've, I've been doing this for a few decades. <laughs> um, you know, before we had titles like CDO, and yeah. you know, I've been um, Chief Data Officer at JP Morgan Chase, I think I was the first CDO there, at HSBC in the UK. I've also worked in biopharma and healthcare. Um, and, you know, when I look at this, I look at how much the, I'd say the challenges change. Mm. is that, you know, we were talking even 10 years ago mm -hmm. and we were using terms like enterprise data warehouses and, and, and early enterprise lakes. Um, enterprises were trying to build an enterprise class asset in the middle to feed the company. But the biggest change I've seen in recent years, um, which is kind of dating myself, is 10 years ago, 20 years ago particularly, my data ecosystem was completely internalized to the company's firewalls. Yeah. All of my data I could control, I could govern yeah. within that firewall. Whether I chose to do it in a federated manner or in a single enterprise service manner, it was it was very contained. And it's not just because of how we digitize industries that we've become more external. In some industries, most of the data is external on yeah. Yeah. where you have very little governance over it, very little control over it. And to try to build a single enterprise structure uh, versus looking at a, a mesh type of construct would take decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the, 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 the ecosystem has changed so much in so many industries that you have to take, you can use your best practices, but you have to take a little bit different viewpoint about how you go out and do it, how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost. All right, all right. So, so I'm starting to think of you not, not just as a data Jedi, but as like data Yoda. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I really feel like it's, you know, sort of so uh, critical for us to, uh, yeah, that doesn't really work in a thing. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so we're, we're really, uh, you know, focused now on trying to, um, you know, get, you know, uh, data mastering done well. And there's sort of this, this logical fit between probabilistic data mastering and um, and also like distributed data mesh, right? Like that if you just have lots of data coming from many different sources, like you have to resolve all that idiosyncrasy in some way. And so, you know, we, we've, we've both dealt with this, you know, problem before, but this idea that while you've got all these external data sources, you've got very heterogeneous infrastructure and like the old traditional top-down MDM approaches are probably not gonna work well. Right? Exactly, I mean, then that approach you'd really have to bring all the data together first so you right. can start mastering. And then to me, in a more distributed manner, can, what parts of mastering can you push out to the edges? Yeah. What parts of mastering kind of in, in a service in the middle? Right. And the governance would you put in the middle? But it's, you you had a diagram up very early on that showed the kind of the full life cycle, the full loop. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, which I think is critical um, in, in a mesh type of construct is that you've got, you have to think of the full life cycle. Yeah. And then what, what part of a service would you do where? Right, 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 right. And so, so like, do you think, you know, how different are the concepts today than they were 10 years or 15 years ago? Like, I mean, do you, Matt, do you think like, I, we're, are we trying to do the same stuff, just maybe I saw, a different type? I saw federated data approaches. Let's be honest. I mean, yeah. 20 years ago, we talked about Inman and Kimball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. The information factory, the enterprise warehouse, yeah. and the federated data market approach. Right, right, right. I've seen companies take a federated approach and be successful day one. Mm. I've not seen anyone take a federated approach and sustain it. Yeah. And I would argue some of it was the technology wasn't mature enough and mm -hmm. scalable enough to do it. And some of it was just the data practices had to mature because you, to have a distributed mesh model, you don't just need technology, you need the right talent mm -hmm. and you need the right set of processes. Yeah, yeah. And then think through, and I love that loop because managing data 
it has a life cycle of managing data, even in ingest and enriching in terms of the mm -hmm. quality, publishing back to a system of uh, record, like mm -hmm. a golden source. That's a loop, that's a closed loop process. Yeah. Even analytics produces or drives new data that needs to feed into that. Yeah. So being able to make sure that closed loop fits within a distributed mesh, I think it takes some thought process. Yeah. And then in terms of who owns and stewards, what part of the process. But I think the, the process piece as well as the talent yeah. and how to distribute that, that's the piece I saw fail during the federated days. Got it. That I think some companies are now beginning to get some wins and it is more of a distributed kind of Kyle type of construct. So more so less about tech so much yeah. and more about the human elements and the but the tech human is, behavioral parts. The, yeah. the tech is I mean, I had a data fabric team nearly a decade ago. Mm. We were inventing the tech. The tech <laughs> didn't the tech didn't exist now now there's commercial yeah. you know, pre presto it's right, yeah, yeah. um so there's commercial. although we both probably use composite way back yeah. in the day for distributed query yeah right? yeah, yeah right and there was one from uh, a vendor change names every year <laughs> <laughs> but it's um it, i think that the the, the the talent piece the process piece of, of how you manage a distributed right. approach is is important, but if that ecosystem is so distributed now, we have no choice. Yeah. So if you've you got this continuous process, right? And it's very, yeah. like one of the key questions we had, you know, from from the group was, how do you know when you're done? Like, how how do you know when? Are are you ever are you ever done? I mean, I had a I had a boss ask me this about 15 years ago. He said, "When is the enterprise warehouse done?" Yeah. And I said, "When will I stop discovering new data sources? Mm -hmm. When will I stop getting new analytic requirements from yeah. my business?" Asking new partners? questions. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Every time you get an answer to a question, you ask a new one. Mm -hmm. And so you're never done. It's when are you done with the core set of requirements and how do you evolve it? Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, you've worked in industry as well as software. Yeah. When you worked in industry, was the company stagnant or were they acquiring new know. companies and yeah. new products and new customer yeah. segments? That, that's always evolving and changing. So you're never done, but you need to have the right model that you could easily add new types of customers, new types of products, new types of third-party data sources. Yeah, yeah. We I remember we used to, I used to talk about this with Christopher Alberg, who started Spotfire, you know, mm -hmm. the Viz tool. Yeah. But Christopher always believed that this idea that analytics were a continuous thing, and this yeah. idea of charting and graphing was sort of a, as a static thing, was sort of a uh, an outdated concept and sort of a, a bit of a red herring that you really wanted to just constantly re-prosecute the data in the Viz like as you learn more things, you get a hypothesis, you test it, and you figure out new stuff, and you ask him other questions. I mean, he's spot on. I, I'll, I'll be bold. I've never seen a set of business um, visual requirements. Yeah. That was what the business wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, had, they, they wanted to go discover, and by the time they were done, they had something very different than they wrote down in a set of requirements. And that's why having like that kind of approach where you're doing rapid discovery. Yeah. And then you start, oh, I really don't want this, I want this, and I want this visual. And I, by the way, there's about a third of the data I don't see there. Where is it? And how to go find it? No, that's not even in our firewalls. <laughs> right. I mean, requirements are going to evolve and change. Yeah. One of the coolest features that I always wanted in the Viz tools, and we implemented, you know, in some Viz using, you know, where we had complete control. If we were building visualization using D3, we could put this little button in there, which was like request more data. Like, or you like, you have people that would say, hey, listen, I wanted to drill down here. Like, can I get more data? And then that sort of went into a queue of stuff at, at Tamer. We call this in, in data steward. Where he said, okay, like these these users, they want more data. They need they need more interest. They need more drill down. They need more sources. Like in like this bi directional thing. But it's just not really how most enterprise data and analytics infrastructure is built. Right? Well, it's not built that way. And I just don't think we thought of it that way mm -hmm. traditionally. It was the one of the areas when I was in banking that we looked at early on was, you know, what is a digital bank, not digitizing a legacy bank, but what was mm -hmm. a digital bank look like? And it wasn't to me unlike an IoT application. Mm -hmm. And that this might be a banking app I use, mm -hmm. but this is also a source of a lot of data mm -hmm. on a customer. Yeah. And, you know, this thought is how much data when the customer interacts with the app do I want to capture? Right. How much data do I not want to capture? So it's an endlessly evolving, changing. Because your point is, I ask a question, now I know the answer. What's the next question I want to know? The next question, and where is that data? I think digital has just added. You know, we look. We, we've all lived through COVID. Yeah. And and the explosion of digital yeah. devices of any type. Um, how many doctor's appointments have you had in the last year? Of anyone's had in the last year that they did virtual. Yeah, yeah. Think of all the data points in that office, in that interaction with that healthcare provider. It probably isn't captured today, but if it was captured and digitized, 
yeah. could lead to better care. So, so one of the things we always talk about is, is with this explosion in terms of the quantity of data and the number of sources, like, you know, not having a good handle on data mastering becomes a big problem. Absolutely. Right? Because if you, if you can't, and we, we're all sort of subject to, you know, being flooded by direct mail that goes, you know, to the same, to, to into my, our inboxes yeah. over and over and over again. And we all want to ask this question, like, don't these companies know who I am? And you know, they keep sending me the same stuff, right? Or, you know, with a slightly modified name or what have you. Like, I mean, it's insane, right? You know, and what, what you know, like, talk to me about, like, mastering from your perspective in the, in the you know, in the next generation, the coming couple of decades when you've got all these. You know, well, because I work in retail banking, yeah. while well, I'll use that as an example, great. wouldn't it be great if every time you pull up your banking app, mm -hmm. could be on a browser, it could be an app on your phone, it could be in any digital channel, that the data you typically look for is already there, mm -hmm. fully protected mm -hmm. and fully, you know, it's, it's the right data and the right kind of protection based on the consent you gave. And it's, it's real time to any real time. It might be a monthly view, a weekly or daily snapshot. But having that data there based on your behavior, but more importantly, if your behavior changes during that experience, mm -hmm. the data is changing. Yeah. So it's to me that that whole digital experience has to be the segment of one. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we have better terms today than the segment of one. That's what we were using five years ago. <laughs> right. But the segment of one is based on your needs yeah. and your behaviors. And you can find that in most industries today. And I think that's one thing that the pandemic has stressed is that everything has to be individualized much yeah. more than it has been. And we, that's going to require a tremendous amount more data. Yeah. And, and you used a word that was re that's really important, I think, you know, that uh, is often lost. I mean, in a lot of enterprises, they talk about data governance, but, um, you know, which kind of implies a whole bunch of, you know, people in IT doing a whole bunch of things for, with data. But, like, you know, isn't the most important thing in governance consent? Like, if, if I as a user, like, consent, like, okay, that's that's what I've said is okay to do with my data or not. It is, and you know, I, I, I lived in the UK for a few years oh, yeah. in Europe, and I lived through the General Data Protection Act, GDPR, and before that, I lived through the original HIPAA, mm -hmm. data um, privacy and security in, in the US healthcare. Uh, consent, so this is not a new thing. No, it's not a new thing, thing but yeah. consent's taken on a lot of different dimensions, mm -hmm. because there's consent for one usage and not consent for another, mm -hmm. or is there consent maybe within, you know, the US, you're seeing privacy acts by state, so there might be consent in Massachusetts, but not in California, where I live. <laughs> right. So I think consent takes on quite a bit. But to me, it comes down to, you know, someone much smarter than me who actually went to MIT, <laughs> uh, taught me a term years ago, the four R's, the right data at the right place, at the right time, with the right protection. Yeah. And I mean, that's what we're talking about. I mean, we, can, we used to call it data everywhere now. Yeah, yeah. But I still like those four R's, maybe because they probably came out of MIT. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's so, it's so pragmatic. Yeah. yeah, so sort of, you know, core. Um, I'm going to encourage any, anybody that's uh, online and is questions uh, would uh, appreciate them putting questions up. I, I have, uh, you know, one question here. Uh, Informatica is a big player in mastering. Uh, can you uh, state a few benefits of using Tamer with regards to Informatica? And like you've, you've used yeah. all these tools. And so maybe maybe contrast like traditional uh, MDM with Informatica versus data mastering with Tamer. Well, I think that there's two pieces here. There's one kind of a full stack platform. Informatica has a lot of products, not just one product. Mm -hmm. And there's best of breed where you put the you piece best of breed products together. Mm -hmm. And that's always a, a decision you make with senior leadership in any company. Yeah. But I mean, traditional MDM, um, I mean, it's a very robust bi-directional mm -hmm. approach that's rules-based. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 50 rules turns into 100 rules, 100 rules turns into 500 rules. Before you know it, you can't even keep track of the number of rules. Yeah. And to me, data mastering is when we go beyond kind of traditional static rules mm -hmm. into an ever-growing learning, you know, algor more algor algorithm-based approach, but something that can learn and grow over time is because the data is going to be changing. Yeah, using the power of the machine yeah. to compensate for the heterogeneity. Yeah, cool. Um, so an, another quick question. According to the recent Gardner hype cycle, data mesh uh, comes uh, under the obsolete category. Uh, what's your take and view on this, right? So is data mesh going away, right? Is data mesh going the way of the data lake? What, what's, what's I, I mean, on? I don't want to speak for Gardner. 
Um, I mean, <laughs> the, the mesh term, I mean, the white paper was only 2019. So we're only looking at, uh, well, in May of 2019, I think was the original paper on yeah. the mesh. So right, we're not right. talking more than a few years. I noticed also, I think in that same hype cycle, um, Data Fabric was right at the top of the cycle. <laughs> and I had a fabric team nine years ago. That, that, that term's been around even longer. So right. is, you know, from Gardner's perspective, is the tech moving faster in one than the other? Because to me, fabric is a capability or component of a, of a mesh. Or do they see mesh as, uh, as something that's just a rapid fad mm -hmm. being replaced by more? If you look at the four components, which you kept keyed on before, those are necessary and needed. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you package them as a single mesh or not. Right. Yeah. But I, I would say, ask Gardner, what, you know, what are they replacing mesh with? Yeah, right. Yeah. Right, right. Well, and it also seems, you know, there was some of this in the last session where there was discussion about, like, you know, doing things in a sort of a, uh, big bang tech project yeah. versus doing things that are a bit more incremental and delivering business value along the way. I know I've heard you talk about how you manage projects like in this way. What are, what are your thoughts well, on that? I mean, let's look at evolution. If you were talking in the 90s, mm -hmm. you had data modeling projects that built nothing more than a conceptual and logical and a business glossary model of mm -hmm. an organization that were four or five years long. Wow. I mean, I've, I've seen this in so many of the large financial institutions, just to get the common vocabulary and a yeah. common set of KPIs. Right. And that was just the modeling piece. And then we went into where- one scheme to yeah, rule them we, all. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. we went into, and then you implement them. And then, and then you, you go into warehouses and lakes. I think the big difference I've seen, and digital has driven a lot of this change, is if I'm a business leader right now, dollar one of investment I give technology, I want to be have measurable business value. Hmm. So dollar one of that uh, tech investment, I want at least dollar one return from a business standpoint. I can't do that with the traditional architecture approach you suggested. Yeah, right. I've got to think. I mean, it used to take us like yeah. you know six months just to provision a so, server. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. and I mean, to I've had large projects. I mean, I built one strategy that actually paid for itself several times over with the cost savings of all the duplicate data and all the infrastructure mm. on the floor of the data centers. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we were able to easily get funded. But that still took multi years to build. Yeah. Today, I, a mesh gives you the ability to focus on business outcomes mm -hmm. and deliver a set of business data products that are outcome-based and measurable from a business standpoint with that dollar one of investment. And then you control, you know, you're connecting, you're connecting legacy data, you're connecting, you know, new digital data. But day two, you can decide what legacy goes away yeah. and what it's replaced with, where it's replaced. But I think the mesh gives you a, little, a lot more flexibility yeah. at controlling what that tech footprint looks like long term while still giving the business value in every release. Here, it, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but like there's an assumption here that like the more you can do that's cloud-based, the better, yeah. right? Like, I mean, you, the more, the less you have to deal with provisioning servers and managing servers, physical servers, the better, right? Yeah. I mean, you focus on what you're good at. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. And then the cloud now is is good enough, right? I mean, exactly. we don't be running. Um, I, I'm amazed constantly at the, uh, performance and scalability of the modern cloud databases. It's like, I mean, you know, we wrestled with all these other systems in the '90s, right? And now to have things like BigQuery and Redshift yeah. and, and and Synapse, and like, I mean, there's lots and lots of advanced uh, database stuff. Is there are there things that you you really like that you're 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 a fan of? Well, I spent a lot of my career having to try to manage a workload. Mm -hmm. to get performance, to get resiliency, get reliability mm -hmm. out. Um, you know, I, I've had to deal with regulators on just reliability and resiliency of platform. Yeah. So I think to your point, cloud gives me a much more distributed, scalable compute. Yeah. So I can refocus my resources on, you know, the, what we're doing for the business on that platform. Okay. And, you're, you're moving yeah. up the stack. You're moving up the stack. I mean, what I, what I like now is I think there's with some of the cloud-based tools, Yeah. I can architect in a way where I'm not dependent on a specific technology, yeah. but I have flexibility and extensibility for changes. So if a mesh comes along, I can start building that connectivity and start delivering uh, data products on that mesh. I can start thinking about how 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 would I put my data governance in a distributed manner across that. Yeah. And then to your point about mastering data, yeah. what parts of mastering would I deploy where? I mean, I, I've always been successful with central data services. Yeah. And services are different than products. Yeah. So between those services and those products, what's distributed, what's centralized, and, and what that ideal, and that has to go along with an organization and how that organization is structured. Yeah, yeah. So, 
So, so you know, one of the other questions that we had from the from the audience was, um, you know, where do you start with Data Master? And you know, we you know, we do this a lot at Tamer End, but it's it's a it's an honest question that that lots of our customers have, and sometimes I feel we feel or that they're they're kind of starting in the right place. Sometimes it feels a bit off. Like, where do you think is the right place to start? I, mean, I, I balance it with what's the priorities of the company. Mm. So, I mean, what are the business outcomes of the top priorities for a company to get? And then you, you, you build a strategy off of that. It might be regulatory based. I've worked in some highly regulated so industries. Like reducing risk. It, reducing yeah. risk, yeah. addressing, if I'm in banking, addressing an MRA from the, yeah. from the regulator. Right. Could, that, that could be where I start. But then if I start there with what I'm doing, how do how do you extend that out to make yeah. it value based? Right, right, or if right. you start with something that's value based, how do you make sure you think of risk and compliance? Yeah. And there, and I always put my cost hat on, which is other dimension. Yeah. How do I think in terms of cost? I, I've never increased data cost in any organization I've went to. I've always been able to modernize and reduce cost wow. because just just eliminating redundancy and inefficiency. Wow. So so it's almost like, I mean, there a lot of people like to talk about these key benefits, business yeah. benefits, like, uh, you know, uh, reducing risk, uh, saving money, um, or, or, or driving revenue, driving yeah. growth. And it always seems that driving growth is one of the hardest things because you have to get the business to sort of commit to these things, regardless of how cool you think things are. And I know you've told me stories in the past where you've had, it's been hard to get, you know, people to commit to using data to drive growth, but it's a lot easier if you're focused on saving It's money. easier, and I, I've been fortunate. I've, in my CDO roles, I've worked for CIOs, mm -hmm. COO, and two CEOs now, mm -hmm. and then twice we've had the role really reporting into the, the head of the business. And even there, and making data as much a revenue vehicle mm -hmm. as we could, it took, it took time a significant amount of time to learn to be good at. Mm -hmm. Not just my data organization, but the business. How do you forecast I'm going to drive a CRM action through a digital channel and I'm going to build it in two weeks and we're going to go live. Is it going to generate two million in the next month or is it going to generate 25 million? Yeah. You're going to miss the first time. <laughs> You're going to be wrong. But, but sure. you learn how to do it and over time you become very surgically precise on it. Right, right, right. Wow, that's amazing. That's really incredible. So, so uh, you know, you know, one last thing before yeah. before we wrap up. Um, you know, I feel like I've learned so much from you over the years uh, about how to do these things well and do data projects well. Um, what's your advice for new teams that are just starting out on their uh, their their data journey? And like, what do you think that they should focus on? You know, both in terms of maybe, maybe you know, summarize it like in terms of tech things that are yeah. most important, and then like human and people things that, that matter. Well, much. I mean, from a tech perspective, and you've taught me this, and we've talked a lot, a lot of conversations around data ops, and mm. you can bring data ops to data mesh so so easily. Is why do something manual when you can build automation? Automate, like even if, even if you, you manually curate in the first iteration, you want to automate over yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, and and, and yeah. to me, that's one of the biggest changes in technology in my career. Is the things I might have taken several years to do, I can now do in weeks to months yeah. if I bring automation. So I think understanding the technology and how to apply it, yeah. and making like mastering much more of an automated process over time, not fully replacing humans, but yeah. partially. And the second piece is talent. Mm -hmm. I spent a career finding talent and building talent roadmaps all around the world of where by by skill set where the talent was. Yeah and what their experience base was. That's harder today. I was having a talk with a, uh, a young um, uh, female CDO today, and I said, it's so great that women are now coming into data. For decades, we've had a hard time getting women leaders in data. Mm -hmm. But as, as many as are coming in, there's even more demand. So for talent right now, yeah. there's, there's less talent in a way because the demand is even higher. That's cool. So we really have to address the uh, talent gap. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's amazing now to be in a position where you know people you know are, are hiring data engineers. Like we were, we were data engineers before yeah. they were called that. But it's really, really inspirational. Well, uh, this has been a great, uh, great talk. Thanks for taking the time, and it's great to see you again as My usual.